In our first story, four young men have been electrocuted Sunday evening at Aoma Sopebre near Ejiso in the Ashanti region. They died when the metal tip of a scaffold they were using to fix a window net accidentally touched a high tension line close to the building. The four were between the ages of 21 and 45 years. Eyewitnesses say the scaffold bent backwards and landed on the high tension wires. <laughs> Because <laughs> Enu just one meter kura enu. I didn't say basa. Because they come in the same car, be 10 meters. And some have sign. Yes, see, I'm an echo. But don't you if you will, any high tension, me high tension. Enu one meter. It is a bit one and a mark. I'm going to see I'm going to say. Net to get a new boo. Net in a nipple boo. Electricity. I can't. I'm going to four. I feel I'm going so those were eyewitnesses of that unfortunate incident. The first was a lady. She was saying that there was a party going on at the house. She describes how it's sad that one of the um, now deceased called Junior is a 21-year-old. He was actually asleep and he was called to help in setting up this canopy for the party. She also says that the police took some two hours to arrive at the scene after they were called and ECG did not cut the PAR in time or the, the PAR um, company did not cut the PAR in time when they were called that there was such an emergency. She believes any of these actions could have um, saved the lives of any of these four people. Uh, following that, you saw the male eyewitness there who said that, again, the police and the fire service took a while to arrive. He also complained that the distance between the high tension cable and the high rise building uh, was, in his estimation, not more than one meter. He, he said that it was his expectation that um, the authorities in charge of regulating the building within urban spaces would ensure that a high rise building is not constructed this close to a high tension cable so that such a simple activity of setting up a canopy um, would end in someone's death. We'll get more details later. And three students of the Adesso Presbyterian Senior High School in the Eastern Region have been crashed to death in a motor vehicle accident on Sunday evening. The male students were riding on a single motorcycle from Isawam to Asama in Kese when they collided head-on with a Hyundai bus, or a Hyundai bus at Roman, a suburb of Adesso. 
16 others, including the driver and the mate of the bus who sustained varying degrees of injuries after their vehicle somersaulted, are said to be responding to treatment at the Insawum Government Hospital. The identities of the deceased have been given as Nana Yao, as Nana Yao and Kwame. They're said to be between the ages of 16 and 18. Our correspondent Kofi Xiao has joined us on the phone with more. Kofi, what more do we know about the accident? Right, you're live on Joy News Desk. We have Kofi Sian with us on the line, where we are learning that three boys have died between the ages of 16 and 18, have died in a motorcycle accident at Adesso in the eastern region. Kofi is with us now. Um, Kofi, tell us a bit more about this accident. Well, Daniel, the people involved in this accident are... Uh, died. They are day students, if I may say so. That is what the authorities are telling us. And they are students of the Adesso Presbyterian Senior High School. So what happened was that they were traveling from uh, Adesso to Asamankese when the incident happened. And so um, the school authorities say that it is very sad that this thing is happening at a time when school just reopened. And the other vehicle, which is a I'm I'm back. Hello? Kofi, Hello? Pardon me. Pardon me, Kofi. Go ahead. Yes. I'm saying that the Hyundai vehicle was was traveling from the opposite direction. That is from Asamankese to Insawam when the incident happened. The report is that when the, they were traveling, the uh, motorbike uh, overtook some vehicles ahead of it and crashed directly into the Hyundai bus, uh, thereby causing the accident. Right. Kofi, tell us a bit more about these three boys. Come again. Tell us a bit more about these three boys. Who are they? These three boys, just as I said before, are students of the uh, Adesso Senior High School, the Presbyterian School there, and they are day students. Uh, as the authorities told me. And so uh, it is sad that this accident uh, could happen at a time when uh, they just reopened school. So if, if you ask me about the students, they are the students of the Adesso Presbyterian Senior High School. Thank you very much, um, Kofi Sia, for joining us. You're live on Joy News Desk, and that was Kofi Sian reporting that three boys have died from a road accident today. The average daily tally for road accidents in the nation has become nine per day. This has increased from eight per day in last year. This year has seen the highest number of road accidents in the period between January and February in the past five years. This is already against the backdrop that Ghana records more than 2,000 deaths from road accidents every single year for the past 10 years. Unfortunate, really. Um, calls have been made from various stakeholders. Um, investigations have been done about the real causes. One statistic that we know is that, for instance, in the case of road accidents, more than 900 occurred last year with um, corresponding deaths as a result of these road accidents also going high. But at the heart of the matter, we must understand that with a daily average of three people, of, of nine people dying, it, it goes to say that before today is over, we might lose more lives. It's quite unfortunate that these boys have passed away, may their souls rest in perfect peace. We'll take a few messages. Stay with us. And you're welcome back. This is Joy News Desk. Let's speak to Cecil Gabra, who's a road transportation expert on this road accident. Cecil, um, very unfortunate incident, isn't it? Yeah, very, 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 very unfortunate. Um, in, in fact, I am 
looking at it to say, hey, if it if it had been my son or uh, my brother's son, or I mean, it, it's really pathetic. And then my condolences to the bereaved families. Uh, it's really a, a, a very sad news this morning that we all uh, you know um, had. But uh, whose fault? That that is the issue, right? I um, for sure think enforcement is one of the main technical ease in road safety that we need to deal with. There is no proper enforcement in this country. If there's an enforcement um, in this country on road regulations, I do not think that three of them will even go and ride on, on the bike. Uh, the two of them will ride on the bike. I don't know who was riding, who knows how to ride. But um, in this country, we have about 99% of riders who do not even have the right um, license to ride. I'm talking about the um, license A, okay, which is uh, for motorcycle motorcycling. I mean, I do not think that uh, um, we 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 they all have it. That is it. Have they had any training on motorbikes? I mean, was it even an issue of Okada? We need to investigate all this, but it's it's really an unf unfortunate situation. Regulations do not work. If regulations work then everybody will understand that two people cannot sit on a motorbike um, motorbikes cannot ride somewhere on the motor uh, on the motorway because the law says that any motorcycle less than um, 125 cubic capacity cannot even be on the motorway but what do we say it's laws 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 are not, are not working and i think i cited an example just yesterday to a very good friend that i was driving on the spinters road and there you are four by fours driving in the middle of the road with their lights on, their, uh, their strobe lights are also on, headlights. I mean, these are not government officials. They are individuals who have fixed the, the lights on. So this is it. Laws are not working. And uh, for me, the political events that took place last year is over. It is time for us to work. We really need the police Ooh. together with the military to help us solve this problem. Because, I mean, my, my grandmother, the fancy lady, will say, Yansuai Edson, whatever happens, they'll continue to do it if the enforcement is not working. Right? We have the regulations, and uh, pillion riders are not even supposed to uh, be doubled or uh, supposed to even have the knowledge of riding, you know? And that's what is causing a lot of accidents on the motor, ride, um, motor riding issues, right? People who sit behind the motors are not riders. They do not know how to ride, so they are not. They don't know even how to sit on their bike. Some of them will will hold the, the riders so firmly, hold their jackets, and some of them will be looking on the on the road and so on. They are supposed to sit down, you know, quite uh, flexible. But in all situations, I think it is time for us to clamp down on unregistered motorbikes, clamp down on riders who do not have the requisite um, documents to write, I'm talking about the license A, and then majority of them do not even have any insurance on, on them. Do they wear helmets? A lot more must look at it. And right. then also we need to look at the issue of um, those um, uh, tricycles, okay? And uh, tricycles, I mean, they are quite a nuisance now, right? Where are they riding on highways and so on? laws must work in this country so um i just told a friend that oh we haven't seen anything yet too. we are going to have more deaths more deaths i'm sorry I, but i need to say it mm. we're going to have more accidents on our road okada accidents are going to increase uh, whether it's okada or motorcycling because they don't know the laws you know um, riders are not supposed to even ride in the middle of the vehicle of uh, of uh, of uh, two vehicles Right. If they are riding, let's say, on a dual carriage road. They are not supposed to even um, ride in the middle of the road. But what do we see? It is there. Pedestrians are it, 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 is, is it not, Mr. Gabrap, is it not, Miss, um, a lack of presence of the police on the roads? Because we do find that there are some police checkpoints. And this was a very rural area in the eastern region, wasn't it? I dare so. Um, could it be that maybe the police are not resourced enough or are not enough on the roads? Um, it is not an issue of whether they are resourced 
or not. But the, the issue now is, is that when they arrest them, where do they take them to? Okay, if they arrest you and you can find your way by giving something out to the police, which is very normal, uh, okay, of a certain policemen, then uh, they will go back and become recalcitrant again, right? So I feel the motor courts must work. They arrest you straight away. They must deal with you. I mean, if you need to go to jail, you must go to jail for three months. If it is uh, 250 penalty units, which is, I think, equivalent to about 600 CDs, pay. And in addition, they should um, go to go to spend some time to do um, some some um, some work. How do, how do you call that work? I mean, uh, community work. Okay, let people suffer for doing the wrong thing than just freeing them to mm. continue to fool around. Mm. So. Um, it's not an issue of police presence, but right. then, uh, police must really arrest such people and then deal with them according to the laws. Are you aware? For that uh, to even uh, become a deterrent. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, that's all time would allow us for this morning. Government has deployed over 30 psychologists to a palm to counsel families of the teenagers that's drowned and survivors of the accident. The team of psychologists would spend a week in the community and take the survivors and families of the deceased through counselling. Gender Minister Ajwa Safo addressed the affected families. With a heavy heart that I have led a team of psychologists from the Mental Health Authority, an association of psychologists and directors from the Ministry of Gender children and social protection to pay you a visit to express our condolences to the bereaved families and the chiefs and the good people of our town for the unfortunate incident involving our dear children. I indeed extend my condolences once again on behalf of His Excellency the President Nana Atodangwa Okufuado, the President of the Republic of Ghana, to the families, chiefs, and people of Afam. As we all know, he already sent my colleague Minister, Honorable Mavis Hawakunsen, Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture, and today our regional minister to represent him at the funeral of the children. And this visit of ours is to follow up on events. We know how hard it is for the affected parents and families in particular. And so our team of psychologists will stay behind and provide the necessary psychological support to the affected families. Let's now hear from some of the psychologists who traveled with the minister. It is a good thing that you are seeing. It's true, we have lost 13 kids. We know families are involved. Brothers and sisters are involved. Immediate communities are involved. We, we are very much sure that this could have some kind of traumatic impact on, on the people who have lived with these young men and women who have lost their lives. And so the idea of engaging Ghana Psychological Association and the Mental Health uh, Authority is to have them liaise with the families and have some kind of psychological intervention so that those who are currently going through traumatic experiences, uh, their emotions will be dealt with. These are a team of professionals who know the world without. And so I would expect that mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, uh, chiefs, and all of us who are still in pain, if they add their professional touch, they should be able to deal with our emotions and the psyche to bring us back to, back to normal. Usually we don't do this in Ghana, but when traumatic experience like this has happened, you will expect it to have some kind of impact on the immediate family. 
You're live on Joe News Desk. Now, Information Minister Kojo Opon Kroma has downplayed projections made by the Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU, on their expectations that the opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, will win the 2024 polls. According to him, government is rather bent on bettering the lives of Ghanaians between now and 2024, so much so that Ghanaians will retain the ruling party in the 2024 polls. Speaking at a news conference in Accra on Sunday, the minister noted that the report only serves as guiding notes and must be treated as such. Right. Um, we have been joined via Zoom by Dr. Ali Dusedu, he's a political scientist, for us to analyze this a bit more. Um, Dr. Seydou, good morning. Thanks for joining us. What do you make of the EIU prediction and government's reaction? Uh, thank you so much, Daniel, and thank you to your viewers. I think the EIU prediction, the first part of the prediction is not something new. We know that it is an established de facto tradition since the beginning of the Fourth Republic that governments usually serve uh, two year, four year, two terms, and then, then we have a transition or an alternation to another government. It happened in 2000, it happened in 2008, and in 2016. And, and there are a lot of traditions like that, which are not scientifically proven, but have been, have been happening in the beginning of the Fourth Republic. And I think literally two of them have actually been broken. The first was the fact that only uh, a sitting president don't lose elections until it happened in 2016 that his Excellency John Drummond and Mahaman lost. The other and uh, established transition was also the fact that only people with Jones in their names lead the country since the beginning of the Fourth Republic. And we saw that His Excellency Nana Dudan Kwakufado has been the first person to lead the country without a John in his name. So it is also possible that the eight year established mandate could be broken, but not just as easy as that. If you look at the history of, of, of the dynamics of this particular tradition, it usually happened that after the eight year period, the, the party that has put the government in place will usually have the incumbent leaving the scene. So there will be an opportunity to elect a new flag bearer. Mm. Usually the new flag bearer, that element of internal democracy usually will create a little bit of disaffection. Mm. People will be hurt in a way. Mm. And if it's not properly managed, it can affect the forward march and the unit of the party. Mm. But usually also, every election is a, is a census on the performance of the incumbent government. So in eight years, government usually become complacent, usually become arrogant. And sometimes most of the promises that have made are not mm. being fulfilled by the government. The people begin to lose confidence in government. They begin to measure government performance vis-a-vis -vis their manifesto. And all those things add up to the collective okay. disaffection that usually leads to the turnover in every right. eight years. But it also has to do with the performance of the opposition party at that particular point right. in time. If they are well organized, exercise so much oversight and put government on its toes and mm -hmm. present itself as a credible alternative, it can feed into that eight-year turnover. So it takes a lot of stakeholder performance and analysis to be able to get there. Okay, now, uh, Doc, let me know. Um, is it too early to start a conversation like this? Um, Freddie Blay has indicated that campaigning should even stop. Uh, he's chairman of the MPP, and he has indicated that we shouldn't even have internal campaigning within the ruling party now. Is it, is it too early for us to be talking about 2024? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's too early and not too early, in a sense. From the perspective of the party, I think it is too early for individuals to start campaigning in a very open manner the way they are doing. The reason is that it distracts government performance. And usually, the success of the party in 2024 is incumbent on the performance and delivery of the current government. So that kind of contestation can lead to serious uh, uh, sabotage serious uh, undermining of each other and in a way that can completely destroy government business. Most of these people are either uh, ministers of state or cabinet ministers. And that can uh, what's the name? detract them from, can cause a there was, oh my God, detraction from their day-to-day -day performance. 
and that will not collectively inure to the benefit of uh, the performance of the government. So from the party's perspective, people should respect the calendar, the electoral calendar of the party, and pick out when it is the right time. But to the individual candidates, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. What they can do is that they can start mobilizing at the grassroots level in a very covert manner, mm. establish fan groups, establish campaign teams, bases, and to be able to do that kind of groundwork at a very, uh, uh, what's in a secret, discreet pace. So at the point that the party is going to open up for nomination, okay. it is not going to be a swell of the actions of the grassroots okay. at, the, at the covert level to a more overt level. And that's going to be a serious continuation of planning. But if you fail to start now, then you are planning to lose. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sedu, just give me a moment. Evans Mesa, who is head of our political desk, has joined us via telephone. So, uh, Evans, with where the conversation has got into, it's really whether or not it's too early for us to be talking about who leads the MPP in 2024. But then again, if the EIU has already made a prediction, which, to be honest, is not that surprising, then the NPP has some work to do to select the right mix of candidates and running mates, is it not? Yeah, I mean, definitely they do. Um, but we need to separate, we need to separate the two, the, the two uh, issues. Sure. I think the EIU versus the internal NPP policy. Sure. Um, mm. In fact, starting a, an internal campaign, I think the personalities involved now will only go to strengthen the EIU's prediction. Because all that it serves to do, if you have the individuals indeed, as has been suggested, campaigning actively at the time when the party is yet to fully take stock. Remember that they've already taxed the team to look into how they lost all these seats. That team, I haven't had, at least publicly, uh, come forward with a completed assessment that the party then can plan with. And yet, you have people who are within the government ranks who are already aggressively campaigning it only serves to further divide the party um at the time when the, the party is yet to fully uh, first of all learn from the lessons of 2020 and then plan for 2024 that's why i guess we had party people warn individuals in the party to stay off i mm. mean it, it's just the way politics is done it, it the party finds itself in an impossible situation there is no way these individuals who are who have political ambitions will stop what they're doing. It, it won't happen. Right. Um, and they will have what we know to call plausible deniability in saying, well, it's not me. Other people are doing it in my name. But their inability to call these people out either directly or indirectly makes them complicit in encouraging it. And it's, so it's an open secret. The people who are interested in, um, in, in taking over from the Nando. This is going to be an impossible attack for the party to stop them from campaigning, either starkly or Okay, back. Okay. Now, now, here's the thing, though, Evans. Realistically speaking, these two candidates are very seasoned. The persons whose names have come up anyway. If you're looking at the front runners being Vice President Dr. Mohamedou Baumia, who has been in the NDC, the NPP's political dialogue since 2008, and Alan Kojo Tremanting, who, as far back as 2004, served as um, ambassador and, and minister. So you have two very seasoned politicians, and you have a grassroots that is forming up ranks. How can this be handled so the MPP does not lose out in 2024? Some face authority. I mean, for me, it, it ends at his doorstep. Um, the two individuals who even before an official campaign is launched, is seen, are seen as front runners, as in, in this case, um, Dr. Baumia and Alan Chavante, are both people that he, the president, has employed to work for him. I think he, he needs to stamp his authority. And there are suggestions uh, from our own checks that in a cabinet meeting last week, that point was made to the two gentlemen um, that they should, they should back off. I think that should be, there should be a stenner there should be a much thinner conversation on this. And we've heard um, Kojo Pini, for example, last week say, what, right. t tell us what uh, President Kufour did uh, back in the day when all the 17 guys wanted to compete. All of them resigned. But, but the challenge is you have a very ambitious vice president who also wants to take over. I mean, what do you do with him, for example? Do you, mm. do you, you, the president cannot, I believe, um, start him from his position, right? 
I mean, mm. for Alan, you could you could have a conversation with him, and so that he can he can do it himself. I think step step aside by himself. Um, so it, the president himself finds himself in a difficult a difficult place. But I think in the end, it comes to his ability to get them to see what the bigger party interest is in holding off now for a couple more years for the party to sort out first his internal. Uh, you know, arrangements, learn from the lessons and plot for the future. Mm. Uh, Doc, Evans brings a very important point, which was the 2020 election, which really surprised a number of political actors regarding the parliamentary poll results. And it has given the NPP work to do. Given for that, what is going on then, how do you, how, how would you advise that situation is handled? Like I was asking, so that we can have, you know, a better party cohesion for the NPP going into 2024? Yeah, I, I think the the MPP as a party needs to take a stock of what happened last year, dropping by 32 seats in parliament from 169 to 137, and even winning the presidential election by a drop in two percentage points from 53% plus 2016 to 51% plus uh, 2020. So I think they, they will need to find out what actually happened. I know the party have taken a lot of initiatives into addressing this. But before that issue <coughs> is brought to, to the fore, the campaign of the people who want to succeed President Akufado, like Ivan's mentioned, will be very difficult to stop. Mm. But I believe that what the president, the president should have started by not appointing people who are going to contest. Mm. But how do you know people who are, not, who are going to contest and people who are not going to contest? And, For example, and if your vice nobody president... was mentioning the name of the Greek minister until recently we heard he is also in, in, in there. And the yeah. vice president is somebody who you goes with the ticket of the, the president. You can't the vice president. So it technically becomes um, uh, unfair mm. to sack people or not appoint people because of presidential ambition and leave the vice president. So what I think they should do is that they should advise them to do it discreetly at the covert, at the grassroots, without uh, openly involved, so that they can focus on prosecuting government business. That okay. has a huge potential of even guaranteeing the success of the person who is going to lead the party mm. in 2024. So it's a kind of delicate balance, and a lot of care needs to be exercised. Other than that, the rank of the party will be divided moving into 2024. Okay, so, so gentlemen, you have given sort of the, the recipe. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask one final question. You've given the recipe. There's a party that needs to rebuild after 2020. You need to focus on governance, campaign underground, so that you're on a good footing for 2024. It will be almost, it will be historic if the MPP wins. What kind of candidate can pull off these four factors that I've mentioned? Evans, I'll start with you. I mean, what kind of candidate can pull off, break the egg as mm -hmm. um, the, the camp of Bahamia had couched quite eloquently? It, it, for me, let's look at the MPP itself in terms of the two candidates that everybody thinks are from front runners. So there's Bahamia and there's Alan. Alan will campaign on the strength that he's been there, right? He's been there for so long. His name has constantly been in the in the mirror as somebody who wants to be presidential, who wants to be a president. And then there is, there is, um, there is, uh, uh, but, but also in, in making, in coming to a conclusion on who the candidate is, you need to also analyze the NDC itself, mm -hmm. right? Because it's the NDC that could take over from the MPP. Mm -hmm. You need a candidate who honestly can't, what, what, what was the MPP's problem in 2020? One of MPP's problems in 2020 was that they, they, they elected people, at least at the parliamentary level, that mm -hmm. did not reflect large the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was so much internal wrangling mm. among the MPP's own ranks. Um, that's saw, for example, the Formula MP emerging as an independent candidate, mm -hmm. etc. So a uniting force, somebody who appeals largely. And the MPP, the MPP's base has always been the middle class. Right? Yeah. And once the middle class begin, the problem with MPP is when they come narrow down to the fact that a lot of the middle class people were disenchanted and did not show up to vote. And then the but but that, that was a governance a issue. Evans, that was a governance issue as opposed to marketing of candidates, wasn't it? No, but yeah, it was both. 
It mm. was both. But my argument, my argument is, my argument is, mm -hmm. Nanado lost almost 300,000 votes from the last, from 2016 to 2020. They lost almost 300,000 votes. In Parliament, they lost historic number of seats. We talked about that in this conversation. Right. My point is, the traditional MPP base that have always been there for them, as in the middle class, um, right. you know, voter, didn't show up as much. We didn't see that necessarily go, that number of votes go to um, John Mahama. Right. Evans, I, 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 I hate to do this, I hate to do this, Evans, but we, we just got some news coming in that we have to um, take. Um, Evans, thank you very much for joining us, Evans. Mensa, uh, Dr. Ali Dusaidu, thank you very much for joining us. We'll get that answer to my final question later. Um, you're live on News Desk. Let's take you live to the Nagrat Lyceum at Adabraka. There is uh, a news conference going on on admission blues. Pools to come to school with. And they are also giving the rules and regulation of the various institutions that they have gained admission to. Students are supposed to sign a document to abide by the rules and regulations of the school. In fact, before students even come to the school, they have already been admitted to various programs. So you are coming knowing very well that you are a science student, a general arts student, a visual arts student, home economics student, and so on and so forth. The headmistress and the staff of Achimota did not deny the young man admission. They rather spelled out to the young man the rules and regulations of Achimota Senior High School. Now, a lot of people seem to have problems with the rules and regulation. It would be a problem if we limit this to haircut. The rules and regulation go beyond haircut. It talks about conformity. Michael, it talks about conformity. It talks about uniformity. It talks about obedience to school rules. And to take the example of Achimota Senior High School, the population of students in Achimota Senior High School is about 4,000 students with about 130 teachers. To be able to manage 4,000 students coming from different homes, with different upbringing, with different training, and different behavior needs to have a universal rules and regulation that ought to be followed by all students in the school. We cannot begin this day to start making exemptions for individual uh, students based on their beliefs, based on their culture, based on their tradition, and based on many other issues. That will lead to a chaotic school environment. And a chaotic school environment becomes an indisciplined school environment that cannot produce the results that we expect. So the rules and regulations are not that of the headmistress, the headmaster, or the teachers. It is the rules and regulation of the institution that ought to be abided by, by every student. Let us also know that we have several religions. Some religions are mass, and some religions are specific to even tribes, and even to families. And all these religious beliefs have their own religious manifestations. If someone's religion is to wear hair, another person's religion is to cover the, the head. Another person's religion is not to wear uh, sandals and shoes. Another person's religion is to go about bare-chested, and so on and so forth. We will not be able to manage all these individual religious inclinations and their manifestations in our schools, taking into consideration the enormity of the work that is before us. When you go to any senior high schools, everything that is done is timed. One, time to wake up, 
time to take your baths, time to eat, time to go for assembly, time to go for classes, time to sleep, days to wash, and so on and so forth. And these rules are supposed to be abided by by every student. There cannot be a congregation of students for somebody to say that I don't want to be part of the congregation. When students congregate in the assembly hall, every student is supposed to be in the assembly hall. When students go to the dining hall, every student is supposed to go to the dining hall. When students are on the field for sports, every student is supposed to be on the field of sports, at least if your school is a disciplined school. And I attended one. Pope John's Secondary School in Kufurudia, which is a very, very, very disciplined school. Henceforth, the performance that we turn out on a yearly basis. I know some people will take me on on this. Because of this, Nagra disagrees totally with the position of the management of the Ghana Education Service. And we are calling on the Ghana Education Service to redirect the headmistress, and the staff of Achimota Senior, Senior High School to ensure that the rules and regulation of Achimota Senior High School, and indeed any other senior school, is abided by, by every student. Let me repeat that, that we are calling on the Director General and the management of Ghana Education Service to redirect the management of Achimota Senior High School to ensure that the school, the students, and indeed everybody abide by the rules and regulation of the school. We are also calling on parents to know that every school has its own rules and regulation. And they should read the rules and regulations of each school before they allow their children to apply to those schools. Now, people are talking about human rights. Let me inform everybody that human rights is better ensured in an environment of rules and regulation. The schools have the right to make rules and regulation, not for any individual, but for all other students. In any case, in Jamaica, in 1985, there was a court ruling on issue of the wearing of Rasta hair. And the court ruling indicated that since the child is a minor, the child ought to obey the school rules. All students that are in our schools are having their teachers and management as in locus parents, in other words, stand in parents. The students are being trained, the students are being educated by teachers who are their parents in their schools. One does not understand why people will want to turn our schools into an amorphous, deregulated institutions where people's whims and caprices hold sway. The school is not a fashion environment. The school is not an environment to exhibit one's religious beliefs. The school is an environment for training. And conformity is part of training. Doing things according to rules and regulation and obedience to authority is part of training. And we expect every student to abide by the rules of the school. Now the threat of going to court. Nagrat welcomes anyone who will want to go to court on this issue and on issue of discipline in our schools. But that when that court issue comes up, Nagrat will attach itself because we are an interested party. That court case will not be limited into the wearing of Rasta. It will be expanded into the establishment of rules and regulation of our schools. If the courts decide that everybody can do whatever he or she likes, you all be our guests as teachers. 
we will also develop ways and means of ensuring that we have proper chaotic school environment. But until then, we expect that all school rules are to be obeyed. NAGRAD solidarizes with the management and teachers of Achimota Senior High School and any other senior high school to ensure that the school rules are obeyed. If any teacher feels intimidated, if any management feels intimidated or is intimidated, the full weight of the union will be brought in support of that management and those teachers in those schools. Thank you very much. If you have some clar uh, clarifications and any questions. I'm, I'm surprised that you are leading this And that's Angel Carbono, who is president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, which is opposed to the Ghana Education Service directive to Achimota School to admit these two students who were refused admission because they had dreadlocks. The conversation will continue in later bulletins. But as the world marks World Water Day today, we take you to Tanokum, a farming community in the Tichiman South District of the Bono East region, where access to a portable source of drinking water has over the years been the community's major challenge. The only water source for the community dried up 10 years ago, and the people since then have to buy water from neighboring communities at a higher cost on a daily basis. Correspondent Anna Sabit visited the community and came through with this report. Water is essential for the survival and productivity of all life and ecosystems. The value of water is about much more than its price. Water has enormous and complex values for our households, food, health, education, and the integrity of our natural environment. To the people of Tanokrum, a farming community under the Tichiman North District of the Bunu East region, water continues to be their scarcest commodity in their everyday life. Tanokrum, Tanokrum, in Sunkwane here. The map me pensua. Our major challenge is water. We have to travel to Tanabuasi or trouble them for water. Now here, in Sobi Wai, Takwaja, they were far away. We sometimes spend between two and three hours to the nearest Takwaja River to fetch water. And yet, three, two hours to three hours. Unruh. Anam Vosente is the chief of Tanokrum. He says lack of water has over the years been the community's major challenge. Here we have a high party so it's where you need to be. Our major challenge is water. How can you live without water? Where is that? Where is that now? This is the issue. Where can I be no journey? The only water source for the people here dried up ten years ago. Since then. The people here would have to buy water from neighboring Tanobuasi community at one city 20 pesos per gallon. We end up spending the little we get in this village buying water. This jerry can here is one city 20 pesos, and the barrel is 12 cities. The situation, according to the people here, negatively affects their farming and economic activities. Esther is a caterer at the Tano Boasi Basic School. She says there are days people here do not eat from the school feeding program due to the absence of water. Sometimes when we don't have access to a tricycle, we don't cook and they don't get water to drink too. 
Bathing daily, according to health authorities, helps remove toxins, reduces stress, improves blood circulation, amongst others. However, the people here, including school-going kids, sometimes stay days without taking a bath due to the absence of water. It's only new hornity. Yeah, two days, medium, man, 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 man. And yes, I mean, can I say, can I say, can I say, without a shower? But after two days, man, you're so angry. Huh? Yeah. It's been three days. I'm angry. Sometimes I go three days without three days. I'm angry. School-going kids in this community are dropping out due to the absence of water. Aha. If we don't get water, we'll stop schooling. With the Sustainable Development Goal 6 focusing on the availability of clean water and sanitation for all, and as the world marks the World Water Day, the people here have one simple plea to authorities. All we need now is a source of drinking water. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tanokro. Let's now take a look at the World Vision Statement to commemorate World Water Day. Um, it actually begins with a Bible verse. Right. Um, every child deserves clean water. That's the theme for World Water Day 2021. Let's look at a bit more. Um, World Vision Ghana will be commemorating World Water Day 2021. 80% of Ghana's population have access to safe drinking water. 49% of public basic schools in Ghana lack access to safe water on their premises. Very worrying statistic there considering the number of children that um, will be going to school without that access. Six million children and their families still lack access to safe water. Now, this cuts across urban and rural areas. And um, so there really is no, no guarantee that any of these six million kids will have water. Um, so that is where we'll wrap up this Bulletin of Joy News Desk. My name is Daniel Daze. Up next is Joy News Interactive. I'll be back at midday.